Okay, so we're going to now take a little bit of a, a change of, of um, direction in our uh, class for the last couple of weeks of class. And we're going to start talking about formal logic because it's really important as a computer scientist that you have a, uh, a good background in formal logic. And, and from discrete structures, you probably have a little bit of a background, but we're going to go a little bit further. So we're going to be talking about basic logic to start out with. You know, how do you make a logical argument? How do you, how do you um, convince someone that something is true? And just like in, in Java, we've got logical, logical operators and or and not. We're studying propositional calculus. Um, and a calculus is just a language of expressions. So every expression has a value. And we're going to have rules that will allow us to transform one expression into another that has exactly the same value. And a proposition is just some sort of an expression that is either true or false. So it is raining outside. I like ice cream. Um, you know, the cat is purple. We're going to be writing um, things called well-formed formulas, which, which we say woofs. Um, and we're using the truth symbols that, that you are completely used to, right? We're going to use a capital T or maybe the word true to represent logical true, um, F or false to represent logical false. Um, for our variables, we're always going to use uppercase letters. And we'll use the standard connectives, not, and, or. Um, and implication. Um, and then we will also, of course, parenthesize things. So here's a recursive definition of a well-formed formula. Um, and we've seen recursive definitions before this semester, right? So, so a wolf is either something very basic, right? So these guys are kind of our, our baseline, um, base case uh, definitions. It's either a truth symbol, so it's either true or false or it could be a propositional variable, or we can do something to a woof. So for example, we can negate a woof or take the conjunction of two woofs. And, this is our and symbol, right? Um, represents conjunction. We can take the disjunction of two woofs. That's just a fancy way to say we're going to or two woofs together. We can use the implies arrow to say A implies B. Or we can put parentheses around a wolf. And, and any of these things that we do down here on the bottom half, um, if we do them, we still have a wolf. So this is how you get a wolf, right? You either start with a very basic one, or you take a basic one and mess with it, or take one that you've messed with and make it bigger. So here's a truth table for all of the basic um, Woof operators, keeping in mind, I mean, we did this the first week of school, right? Um, P implies Q is exactly the same as is equivalent to, right? That's what these, uh, that triple equal sign means, is equivalent to. Um, not P or Q, right? And so you should be able to look at this truth table and say, yep, I get it. We went over this before. I get it now. If you don't get it, uh, <laughs> talk to me quickly. And we've also talked about this before, right? We have um, precedence rules for, um, for our wolf operators. So not is the, has the highest precedence, precedence, right? Logical not. So that binds the most tightly. Um, implication binds um, uh, less tightly. And, or, and implies are all left associative. That means when you parenthesize it, you start parenthesizing from the left to right. So here's your here's an example of left associative on implications, right? So A implies B implies C. Um, because it's left associative, we we uh, circle or we put parentheses around the the um, that first implication first, right? And of course, you know, if we have an expression like that, it really means that, right? That's how we do the parentheses on this. You guys are good with precedence, right, in parentheses. Um, since and has a higher precedence than or, um, without parentheses, this thing is equivalent to this. That's what it really means, right? 
And similarly, we can do that. What I'm going to ask you to do is, is just please, 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 whenever possible, just put parentheses around your work. Um, I try to do it. I do most of the time remember this precedence table, but and so should you, but I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't think that, that you should rely on the world having memorized that in order to make sure that your proofs are correct. So the more you can parenthesize, the, the more straightforward it is for people. Um, the big exception to this, I think, is I don't usually put parentheses around things that have not. So I don't usually, I don't usually make this first conversion from not A and B to not A and B. I think everybody is pretty, pretty much understands that the not symbol binds the most tightly. So I may not, I may not parenthesize that as frequently as I, as as I might um, do the other ones. So here's a um, an interesting question: Is P and Q or R a woof? And how do we figure that out? Well, we have to look at the definition of a woof, right? And here's our definition of what a woof could be. Um, but of course, I've missed my you know most important rule, which is before we start to do anything really we should parenthesize this, right? Because it's got an and and an or in it and we want to make sure that we know um, which has higher precedence and we look and in our precedence table and has a higher precedence. So let's just put some parentheses around that. So it looks like that if we do it neatly. And now we can think about the question as to whether, um, answer the question whether P and Q um, or R is in fact a woof. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to step through it uh, step by step and give justifications based on our definition of a wolf. So step one, um, the propositional variable P is a wolf, right? Um, because all propositional variables are wolves, right? And of course, we can use the same reasoning for Q and the same reasoning for R. So now I have um, three woofs that I know about. These are just pieces of my big woof that I'm trying to prove though, right? I want to prove whether this thing is a woof. So of course P and Q is a woof using the conjunction um, uh, rule part of the definition, right? Conjunction, remember, is just a fancy word for and, um, and so I suppose really I should have put numbers in here. And the reason that P and Q is a wolf is because of lines 1 and 2 and conjunction. Similarly, um, P and Q with parentheses around it is a wolf because of line 4 and the parentheses rule in here. And we can OR that with R. Um, because of our disjunction rule, right, the rule about or in the definition of woofs. So, um, you know, again, let's see, one, two, that would be line three, and line five. So this comes from line, can't read that, can you? Lines three and five. And boom, we're done. I guess P and Q or R is indeed a woof. So one thing it's useful to know is that every woof has a unique syntax tree and truth table. Um, that depends on our precedence rules, by the way. So of course, if I want to say what's the syntax tree and truth table for this woof, I first have to convert it into a parenthesized one so I can see who has priority. Once I know um, the order of operations here, drawing a syntax tree is really easy, right? So Implications is a binary operator that operates on these two subparts, right? These two subwoofs. So this is the left thing implies the right thing. This left piece implies the right piece. The piece here on the left is um, a negation of a singleton, right? So we have our negation of P. And on the right, we have the woof Q and R, right? The conjunction of two of, two of these um, propositional variables. Um, and so there's our 
ampersand with Q and R. So, I mean, syntax tree, pretty straightforward. And of course, the um, truth table is uh, equally straightforward too. We need, um, I mean, you should know truth tables, right? Um, but we've got our three um, propositional variables. Sorry about that. P, Q, and R here. And we have all possible combinations of um, true, false. And, and you'll notice, you know, my standard way is to do um, start with the first one and make it true for the first half, false for the second. And then, you know, do it in twos for Q and every other one for R. And that gives us um, all the different values. And then the way I have um, structured this is I've taken the different pieces of the, um, the wolf and broken it down into the separate pieces. So for starters, I do not P. So if I look here, let's see. Well, that's pretty easy, right? Not p, since p is true for the first fall, uh, the first four, and false for the last four. Then not p is the other way around. Um, q and r. Let's see. True and true um, is true. True and false is false. False and true is true. False and false is false. True and true is true. True and false is false. You see what I'm doing here, right? I'm looking at false and true now. And that is false. And the last one is false and false. So that's false. Um, and now I can take do this whole implication. And I can do the whole implication by saying, all right, well, let me look at this one. Does false imply true? Well, for sure it does. And we can do the next one. Does false imply false? Yeah, it does. In fact, false implies anything, right? So these first ones, um, that's false, that's false. So we can make that true. And let's see, does true imply true? Yeah. Does true imply false? No way, right? Remember implication. A implies B is the same as not A or B. So if A is true and B is false, then we've got not true or false, which is false, right? So true does not imply false. No way. True does not imply false, and true does not imply false. So there's a truth table um, for, uh, for this wolf here, right? And of course, this wolf here is exactly the same as this wolf here. It's just I put the parentheses on it. And some fancy words to use at your next um, logic party, right? We use the term tautology um, to refer to a woof where the truth table values are all true. So, for example, B or not B is a tautology, right? A woof is a contradiction if its truth table values are all false. So if we look at, say, the truth table values for B and not B, we always come up with false. And we use the term contingency if it has both true and false values. So maybe, you know, I don't know, B and C. Now we're going to start to talk about um, doing some proofs with logic. And we're going to start by proving um, logical equivalence between two WIFs, right? So two WIFs are, are logically equivalent. If we have a WIF A and a WIF B, um, they are the same if... Every time um, when you fill out the uh, truth table, you get the same results for the same variables, right, if you, if you use the same variables. So we'll use this um, equivalence term. And effectively, what does this mean? It means if you do your truth table, and maybe I have some propositional variables x, y, and z, and I have my wolf a and my wolf b, and if I fill in these guys, A happens to be true, true, false, false, and then stuff over here. If B is also true, true, false, false, and the same stuff down here, then these two woofs, A and B, are logically equivalent. Now, it's important to note that you don't have to use all of the same variables to be equivalent. So, for example, Here's two woofs, um, not P, which just has the uh, propositional variable P in it. 
and this other longer woof, which has two propositional variables, P and Q. But if you look at the truth table here, we have false, false, true, true, false, false, true, true. So these two are indeed logically equivalent. An alternate way to um, define equivalence is you can prove that A is equivalent to B if you can show that both A implies B and B implies A. You need to show both of these guys, and if you do that in a proof, you can show that that's true, right? Or, of course, if you do that in a truth table. Though if you prove the implies in a truth table, you're doing more work than if you just did the truth table for A and B. Um, note that our triple equals, our equivalence here, is in fact an equivalence relation, and you remember equivalence relations from... Um, from uh, discrete structures, right? It's reflexive, which means it does it to itself. So the um, variable R is equivalent to R. It's symmetric. If you know that R is equivalent to S, then S is also equivalent to R. And it's also transitive. So if R is uh, equivalent to S, S is equivalent to T, that tells us that R is also going to be equivalent to T. Now, in your book, they give us a big table of basic equivalences. This is the sheet that I also put on, um, on the class website as an extra um, download, except when I put it on the class website, it looks more like this, um, which is simply that I have added these names, right? So that as a class, we can use these names. So instead of saying, oh, it's just one of the disjunction rules, we can say it's disjunction 1, disjunction 2, disjunction 3, disjunction 4, whatever. Um, before you continue with this video, if you have not already downloaded and printed out um, the sheet that's on the web that has this stuff on it, then please do so now because I'm going to refer to these names um, throughout the rest of the lecture and if you don't know what they are, it will be confusing. Ah, one more thing. When you look at the sheet, you will actually see that on the on the printout sheet that you download from me, um, there are two more rules down here um, that are also called distributive AND. So, um, so you can distribute AND um, this way, right? The way that it's shown here. Um, but it's also legal to say, let's see. B or C and A. Um, that's equivalent to B and A or C and A. Um, and on the sheet that you hopefully printed out already, you'll see that's just another one called distributive AND um, or distributing over AND. Um, and then we have um, the equivalent also to this or. We can say B and C or A is equivalent to B or A and C or A. And you'll find that that's called distributing or um, on the handout sheet that you've downloaded. Okay, so suppose that we actually want to prove that um, that these two woofs, right, this first one here and the second one here, are actually equivalent, right? That's our little equivalency uh, notation again, right? There's a couple of different ways you can do that. The first um, one that, that um, students often like because uh, you don't need sort of the formal proofs with QED and whatever is just truth tables, right? So what we could do is we could set up a truth table. So let's see, we have the variables A, B, and C. So we could go, you know, like what are all the different values it could take on, right? There's eight of them, right? So we got true, 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 false, uh, true, false, true, true, false, 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 true, true, and so on, right? So we could do all of these. And then we could start taking pieces of this. So we could say, all right, well, what is B implies C, right? And we could do this whole truth table thing where we say, all right, well, let's see. B implies C for this is um, true. 
and B implies C on this next line is false, right? And so what about A implies B implies C? And we could figure that out. So uh, here it's true and here it's false, right? And we could do this for everything. And then also figure out A implies C, right? I'll take another small piece of this. Um, so what's A implies C? And uh, in this case, A implies C is true. In this case, A implies C is false. And then we'd have, if I had just a little bit more room, uh, we'd have our, uh, we'd have our, what do we got? B implies, A implies C. That's an implies, you can see that, right? Um, and then we would try and say, okay, let's see. So B implies, A implies C is true for that. So this is actually the first line. And then on the second, um, it would be false. And we would fill in all of these things, right? And what we would discover, had we, if we filled all of these in, come on, um, is that this column here would be exactly the same as this column, right? So if we have, you know, a true here, it'll be a true here. And when we have a false here, we'll have a false here. And that's going to be true for everything on down. And if that is, in fact, the case, then we can say, woohoo, um, these two woofs here are, in fact, so there's woof number one. And there's with number two, and we can say, yep, they are in fact equivalent, right? Lots of students like using truth tables because, you know, it really is just plug and chug. The trouble with truth tables, of course, is that, you know, here we've got three variables, A, B, and C, and that's going to give us eight um, possible uh, rows on our, on our, uh, on our table. Um, if we had four variables, we've got 16 rows, and it just grows exponentially. Um, and that can be a real pain to, to write out this, this table for anything that sort of is realistically large, right? These are both pretty small whiffs, woofs, sorry. Uh, okay. So another thing that you can do, and this is something that I used to um, take some time uh, to teach in class, but I've decided that we're better off um, learning something else with the time. Um, is how to use the equivalency rules to actually do a proof. So you can take that sheet that you've that you know you've already printed out, right? And you can look at it and you can say, well, you know, this first piece I'm going to try. Oops, I'm going to try and outline it a little bit better, but not successfully, right? Is equivalent to this second piece by this conversion one rule, and then the second piece is equivalent to this one by conversion one again, and then we can use associativity to say it's equivalent to that and so on. And so you can write an actual proof that that um, uses the conversion rules that, that we have to um, show that two woofs are actually equivalent. So that's something else you can do. But as I said, we're not going to spend too much time on that, not because it's not interesting and not because it's not good, but I found in the last few years that, that this is probably more confusing to students than helpful because the next thing we're going to do right at this lecture is we're going to start talking about another way to do proofs and, and students were just getting too confused between the two two of them. So um, it's also important to note that we can't prove everything with equivalency rules. So for example, we can't prove this this statement, right? This wolf, right? So you know, for sure it makes sense that if Q is true and R is also true, right? If we know that that Q and R together is true, um, for sure that must imply that R must be true by itself, right? But since they're not equivalent, right, we can't really, we can't do anything with that giant sheet of equivalency rules that I've given you. So, you know, I want you to take a look at the equivalency rules sheet and say, oh yeah, I kind of get it, right? I look, you know, look at the different statements on there and say, yeah, these make sense. And you'll see some familiar ones like De Morgan's and stuff on there that you've been using forever. Um, but uh, equivalency rules can't prove everything. And so the third option, and that's where we're going to go, as I said, next lecture, um, is we're going to use um, some formal reasoning techniques along with a set of proof rules. And what we're going to do, if you remember earlier, I said that that equivalent, right, to show that, um, you know, A is equivalent to B, you can also just show that A implies B and B implies A, right? So that's what we're going to do. Um, 
you know, if we uh, want to use this formal reasoning, and again, we'll talk more about this next time, um, then if we prove both of these, we have shown, you know, we've proven this equivalence, right? And so that's what we're going to be doing um, eventually. And of course, the bonus with these formal um, proof rules that we're going to have is we'll also be able to prove things like this um, Q and R implies R. So it's going to be much more powerful than just using the equivalency rules. So just to show you where we're going from here, um, the rest of this lecture, we're going to spend a little more time using the equivalency rules just to learn how to convert woofs into um, what are called normal forms. Um, and then in the next lecture, we'll move into formal reasoning and these proof rules that let us prove, um, you know, more interesting things like this, you know, A and B implies A, for example. Okay, so one more brief topic before we, um, before we wrap up this slide set. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how to put woofs into kind of a standardized form. Now, this standardized form is very, very useful if you want to do um, proofs about, about generic woofs. You want, to, you want to prove something, you say, well, let me start by turning it into standard form, and then let me show you something. Um, so I'm going to show you how to put it into standard form. And we'll start with this definition of a literal. A literal is just A or not A, right? Or Q or not Q. Any old propositional variable you've got or the negation of a propositional variable. Now, this standardized form is called disjunctive normal form. Remember, disjunction is, is or, right? So disjunction normal form is a woof where you have a bunch of pieces of other woofs that are ORed together, right? Disjunctive normal form, you OR together a bunch of pieces. What do those pieces look like? Well, each of those pieces is the conjunction, that's AND, of literals. So disjunctive normal form means you OR together a bunch of pieces. Each of those pieces is an AND piece. So here's some examples down here. Um, the first one is pretty straightforward. Let me just enlarge this slightly. Let's move it up and make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay. So remember, we're going to OR a bunch of AND pieces. So this first one, we are ORing two pieces. And if you look inside the parentheses, each of these pieces is a bunch of literals, right? Um, that are anded together. So that is in um, disjunctive normal form. We'll look at the second one. Again, we are oaring together. Oh, look, this time we have four pieces, right? Um, that first piece is a bunch of literals that are anded together. Second one, a bunch of literals anded, anded together. Third one, same thing. The last one, well, there is only one literal in there that by default is fine. It, it's, you know, it's kind of anded with nothing, but that's fine. So, so this is also in disjunctive normal form, which brings me to the point that just a literal by itself is already in disjunctive normal form. Um, and so, uh, you know, that is disjunctive normal form. Um, and in fact, so is this last one, which can be confusing to people, right? This is one thing anded, right, um, and ORed with nothing else. So actually kind of by default that's disjunctive normal form. It's a little bit hokey, but, but you get the idea. Now perhaps the first question that came into your head was why did I OR together a bunch of things that were ANDed? Well, it's because that was disjunctive normal form. Now I can also show you there is, of course, a conjunctive normal form. In conjunctive normal form, um, I AND together a bunch of things that are ORed. So same thing here. Here's some examples that are in conjunctive normal form. I have a woof that just consists of a bunch of literals, right? A or not A, B or not B, and so on, um, that are ORed together. There's some more literals that are ORed together, and I take the conjunction of those, the AND of them. Same thing here a bunch of ORs, and then this kind of is just the, the default, um, the kind of most basic case of something that's ORed with nothing, right? So I AND those things together. Um, 
of course, a literal by itself is also in conjunctive normal form, right? So this, this example was on both sides. So is this one, right? It's a literal. Um, uh, we're looking at conjunctive normal form now, the and one. So you wouldn't be surprised that this is in conjunctive normal form. And what you just have to remember is that this last one is also in conjunctive normal form, the second to last one, the one that hopefully you now see an arrow pointing at, um, because it is the and of a bunch of woofs where those woofs are the or together of a bunch of literals, which this is. So I'm not going to prove it to you, though I will show you kind of how to do it, um, at least for one of these. But it is the case that any woof that you see has a woof is equivalent to another woof in disjunctive normal form and is also equivalent to another woof in conjunctive normal form. Okay, And this, like I said earlier, is, is very important for when you're doing generic proofs about woofs. Now you can just say, oh, well, suppose I have a woof in disjunctive normal form, and then you keep proving from there. Well, that supposition is fine because any woof has an equivalent one in disjunctive normal form. So let's talk about how you do this conversion. Right? How can you turn it in? I'm going to show you the process. I'm not actually going to prove that the process always works, but I'm going to show you how to do the process. Um, one thing that you kind of do throughout the process, I'm not quite sure why I put it into step three, but whenever you see any double negations, you just get rid of them as soon as you see them. But really, there's kind of a one, two, three um, steps that you go through. First, you get rid of any implications. Um, just use that some conversions rule one to change them into... Uh, into, you know, if I have A implies B, just change that into not A or B, right? Um, and then the second thing to do is to use De Morgan's Law to push the not into the parentheses, and I just remembered my next slide is going to tell you how to do that, so I won't write that in there. And the last thing is to use these distributive and associative equivalences that are on your sheet. So there you go, the magic of slides. Um, if I am getting rid of the, um, well, the double negation whenever it shows up, right? That's easy, right? How to get rid of implications. We already talked about this. How to use De Morgan's Law. Well, you just use the rules De Morgan's 1 and De Morgan's 2 to, to, uh, to do those. Um, it, 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 you can see it effectively kind of pushes these not symbols into the parentheses. Maybe you understand now what I say by pushing it in, right? I'm going to convert something that has a not sign on the outside of the parentheses to something that has a not sign associated with the individual, um, in this case, literals that are inside of there. They don't have to be literals, of course, for this. Um, and finally, I'm going to use the distributed, um, distributive and, and associative equivalences, right? So distributive and, distributive or, and here is associativity for or and associativity for and. So let's do an example. Let's um, convert this woof here into um, disjunctive normal form, right? So disjunctive normal form disjunction is or. So we're going to make a bunch of ands, um, sorry, a bunch of, of um, expressions that are the ands of literals, right? And we'll or each of those with another, right? And what I've done is I've put the reminder down here of what are the things we need to do. So we'll get started. Let's 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 um, get rid of those implications. So there you go. I've pushed one of those implications in, right? And you see how I did it, right? I, I said that um, this implication piece here, right, I can just say turn that one into not that piece or the piece on the right. Did the same thing again. This time I got rid of this one. Um, notice that uh, this A implies B or C here, right? The implication here, boy, that was lazy of me, actually has parentheses on there. If you look at the rules of precedence, so that turns into this. And then we can use De Morgan's to push that um, negation inside of these parentheses. But now you see I've got a double negative. 
So we'll get rid of that double negation, right? And we can look and say, am I in disjunctive normal form yet? Well, I have the or of something, but it's not the or of literals, right? Because this expression here, this wolf, is not a literal yet, right? It is a, it is, um, because remember, a literal has to be just a, a, a propositional variable or the not of it. So we still have to go a little bit further, but we can just try and push in that negation using um, uh, De Morgan again. And there you go. Now we have something that's in disjunctive normal form, right? I've got these parentheses on the inside, but um, uh, these ones here. But because of associativity, you know, that could go, that could be equivalent to putting the parentheses there instead, which means that this really, if we were just writing this out, it would be A and not B and not C or a and D, and if you look at it like that, which it is equivalent to, right, um, then it is, I'm taking the disjunction, the or of a bunch of clauses that just have ands of literals. Let's try one more. Um, I'm trying to convert to disjunctive normal form. Notice that I've given you an expression, a wolf, that's actually in conjunctive normal form, but I want to switch it. Um, so again, I don't see any double negatives, we'll keep that in mind, but, and there's no implications, um, and really no knots to push, so I guess we'll use the whole distributive and associative, right? How does that work? Well, now you need to look at this a little bit carefully. I've put in purple what I'm doing. Um, this, this stuff down here at the bottom is just my comments to help you understand what I've done here, right? So what I've done is I'm treating this first piece, A or B, as one piece. And then um, I have C as one piece and D as one piece, right? So I'm taking this, this equivalence, right, the distributive and rule, where I say um, if I take P and Q or R, right, I can say that's the same thing as P and Q or P and R, right? And I'm just treating this whole piece, A or B, as my P. And so then the result is that. And you can see I, I, I kind of highlighted in purple. Um, perhaps I should have done that here too. Let's see, can I change colors? Um, uh, this P part, right? So. That's what I'm doing. So take a look. This should make sense, right? But so there is one step that I've done, and I've done that by um, the uh, distributive um, property of and, right? Um, but this still is not in disjunctive normal form, right? So we need to keep going. So you can see I've done the same thing here using that other... Um, distributed and rule, which is the one I added to your sheet, right? So so now we're ending with something that comes after it. Um, and so, you know, Q or R and P is equivalent to Q and P or R and P, right? Um, where in this case, we've got this piece that I'm expanding, and I expand it into that piece. And we take another application of that um, distributed and and um, or distributing and and um, and we do it for that purple outlined piece to get this piece. And you know, strictly speaking, we're not in disjunctive normal form yet because of the way we've parenthesized this, right? So if I open this up, 
Um, and this is a pretty nitpicky point, but you know me, I can be nitpicky sometimes. Um, these parentheses and these ones make it a little bit messy. Um, and so what we can do is we can just say, all right, well, um, if we use the rules of associativity, we could actually say, well, that's the same as first doing these and then doing these and then doing these. And that's what I've just shown here. And of course, um, I showed it by eliminating all the parentheses saying, oh, yes, it's it's going here um, by, uh, in fact, two steps of using the associativity rule, tis, tis, Dr. K. Um, but yeah, it's fine. If I have a bunch of ors, um, I can use associativity and say this is actually equivalent to that. And there's the next set of my parentheses, right? So time to go do some problem sets.